Welcome back everybody for another deep dive. This time uh, we're going to be looking at a YouTube video by In The Mix and uh, he calls it 10 years of mixing advice. Basically he's, he's been doing this for 10 years professionally and he just kind of wanted to put out a video about you know some of the things that he's learned that have helped him along the way and hopefully can help some other people too. Yeah, it's really cool kind of like a look back and, and what he's picked up along the way. It was interesting to see how some of his advice kind of goes against some of the common things that you hear all the time, you know, like the typical mixing tips and tricks. Yeah, one of the first things that he mentioned was that you can fix so many mixing problems in the arrangement. Mm. And I thought that was really interesting because it's not really something that you hear that often. People are always yeah. talking about you know, EQ and compression and all this other stuff. Yeah, it's like people want that magic plug-in or that secret setting, but he's saying that a lot of times it goes back to the arrangement itself. Yeah, he said that a lot of times when he gets a track and it's not mixing well. It's right. Because the arrangement is not good. Right, it's like the foundation is shaky. So no matter how much you try to polish it up in the mix, you're still gonna have those underlying problems. He said something like, if the arrangement is good, the track will practically mix itself. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of truth to that. When you have a well-arranged track where each element has its own space, it just naturally sounds good. You don't have to fight against the arrangement. Right, it's like you're not trying to force things to fit together. They just naturally belong together. And it makes you realize how important it is to think about the arrangement from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, not just writing a good song, but thinking about how those elements are going to work together sonically. Yeah, it's like you're arranging for the mix as well. Exactly. And he also had some interesting thoughts about synth presets, which I think is something that a lot of people can relate to. Oh yeah, those synth presets can be so tempting, especially when you're first starting out. You load up a preset and it sounds huge and epic. Mm -hmm. And you're like, okay, this is it. This is the sound. Right, but then you put a few of those together and suddenly your mix is a complete mess. Yeah, he called it sonic claustrophobia. It's like all those sounds are fighting for space. And even if you try to EQ them and carve out space for each one, it's still a struggle because those presets are often so dense and full range. Yeah, he said that a lot of those presets are designed to sound good in isolation but they don't necessarily work well together. Right, they're like those flashy sports cars that look great in the showroom, but they're not very practical for everyday driving. So what he's saying is that you need to be willing to compromise. You might have this amazing synth preset that you love, but if it's not working in the mix... You might need to let it go, or at least tweak it so that it fits better with the other elements. Yeah, he said that sometimes less is more. It's better to have a few well-chosen sounds that work together. Than a bunch of sounds that are all fighting for attention. And that kind of leads into his next point, which is about phase relationships. Ah, yes, phase, the silent killer of mixes. He told this funny story about how he used to cringe when he listened back to his old mixes because he hadn't paid attention to phase issues. Yeah, it's one of those things that you don't really think about until it's too late. He said that, especially in the low end, phase problems can really wreak havoc on your mix. Yeah, if you have two sounds that are out of phase, they can actually cancel each other out, which can lead to a weak and undefined low end. He used the example of layering kick drums if the waveforms aren't aligned. You can end up with a kick that sounds thin and wimpy no matter how much you boost it. So his advice is to always zoom in on your waveforms. And make sure that they're aligned. It's a simple check. But it can save you a lot of headache down the road. Yeah, it's one of those things that seems obvious in retrospect. But it's easy to overlook when you're in the thick of mixing. Especially when you're focused on all the other elements, like EQ and compression and effects. Right, it's easy to get caught up in the details. And forget about the fundamentals. So now I want to talk about this concept that he introduced. He calls it the five-click rule. Oh yeah, I love that one too. It's so simple, but so effective. Basically, he says that if any task in your DW takes more than five clicks, you're probably doing it the hard way. Yeah, it's all about efficiency. Streamlining your workflow so that you can focus on the music. Think about all the little things that you do in your DEW. Creating folders, yeah. loading projects, opening plugins. All of those things can be done in a few clicks. If you know the right shortcuts and techniques. It's about working smarter, not harder. And avoiding those moments where you're wrestling with the software. Instead of making music. I know I've definitely been there where I'm like clicking through menus and submenus, just trying to find a simple setting. And it's so frustrating. 
because it takes you out of the creative flow. Exactly. So the five click rule is a great way to remind yourself to stay efficient and keep the focus on the music. It's like decluttering your workspace so that you have more room to create. Now this next one is a bit controversial. He said that the loudness wars are over and loudness won. Ooh, that's a bold statement. Especially with all the talk about streaming services and loudness normalization. Right, it seems like everyone is trying to make music quieter these days. But he's saying that the pros are not really following those rules. They're prioritizing what sounds best, even if it means going above the recommended levels. He even referenced his own mastering video where he analyzed tracks from some of the top engineers in the industry. And a lot of them were pushing the limits. They were going for a louder, more impactful sound, even if it meant exceeding those suggested levels. So it's not that mastering has become irrelevant. It's about finding the optimal loudness for each track. And that takes an experienced ear and the expertise of a skilled mastering engineer. Now, speaking of context, he also had some advice about mixing in context. Ah, yes. The importance of not soloing everything. He said that it's tempting to isolate each track and make it sound perfect in isolation. But that can be deceiving because sounds change drastically when they're back in the full mix. You might find yourself constantly remixing. Because what sounded great, soloed, just doesn't work in the context of the entire song. So instead of soloing that snare, to get it sounding perfect, mm. keep the other drums playing softly in the background. If you're working on vocals, have the guitars or synths subtly present as well. This way you're making decisions that benefit the whole track. You're essentially training your ears to hear how everything interacts, which is a crucial skill for any mixer. And by mixing in context, you avoid that jarring effect of constantly switching between solo tracks and the full mix. Which can lead to ear fatigue much faster. Now this next bit might resonate with you, especially if you've ever been on the receiving end of this classic piece of advice. Yeah. It's not about the gear, it's about the ear. Oh yeah, that one. It can feel a bit like gaslighting sometimes, especially coming from people with studios full of high-end equipment. Right. But he acknowledges that while skill and knowledge are important, sometimes you do need the right tools for the job. Like accurate monitoring, for example. It's essential for making informed mixing decisions. He shared an anecdote about his early setup and how it limited his work, despite his growing skill set. It's a good reminder that we shouldn't dismiss the role of equipment entirely. Be aware of your gear's limitations. Invest in quality tools when possible. And don't let anyone tell you that your equipment doesn't matter. It does. Yeah, it's all about finding that balance, honing your skills, and recognizing when you might need to upgrade your tools to reach the next level. Now, speaking of seeking knowledge and upgrading your skills, he dives into the often mucky world of online advice. Those forms, blogs, and courses, promising mixing formulas for success. Right, it's easy to get caught up in those quick fix promises when I mean, you're starting out. He even admitted to falling into that trap early on, absorbing advice from forums that he later had to unlearn. It's understandable when you're eager to learn. It's tempting to grasp at anything that sounds like a magic bullet, a shortcut to bypass the hard work. But the reality is, there are no one-size-fits-all solutions in music. Exactly. Every song is different. Every mix is different. And what works for one song might not work for another. He particularly called out those selling formulas for mixing, producing, or mastering. He argues that music production is an art form, not a science. So these rigid formulas often do more harm than good. Yeah, it's like trying to paint a masterpiece by following a paint-by-numbers kit. It might look okay from a distance, but it's lacking that soul. That unique expression. He used the example of the 3.6 dB compression rule, which was touted online as some sort of golden rule for compression. Right, like you should always compress every track by 3.6 dB. But in reality, the amount of compression you apply depends entirely on the specific track and what you're aiming for. Exactly. There's no magic number. So what's the takeaway here for our listener? What can they do to navigate this sea of information and avoid those misleading formulas? It all boils down to developing critical thinking skills. Don't blindly accept every piece of advice you encounter online just because it's popular or it comes from someone with a large following. Right. Do your own research. Experiment. Question assumptions. And most importantly, trust your own ears. It's about becoming an independent thinker, not just a follower. You have to develop your own judgment and your unique voice. Which actually ties in nicely with his point about the five-click rule. 
by streamlining your workflow yeah. and becoming more efficient in your DIW, you free up more mental space to focus on those critical listening skills. And make informed decisions based on what you hear, not just on what someone told you online. It's about breaking free from those technical constraints and allowing yourself to experiment explore and truly develop your artistic voice and that's something he emphasizes throughout the video embracing the creative side of music production he argues that getting caught up in the technical minutia can actually stifle creativity it can make music production feel like a chore a series of technical hurdles to overcome rather than a joyful process of exploration and expression he reminds us that ultimately music is about connecting with people on an emotional level it's about creating something that moves them inspires them, makes them feel... You can't do that Yeah. if you're constantly bogged down in technical details. That's not to say that technical skills aren't important, they are. But they shouldn't overshadow the artistic side of the process. You need a balance. It's about finding that sweet spot where your technical skills support your creative vision, not hinder it. And that's where that critical thinking comes in again. You need to be able to assess the information you're receiving, filter out the noise, and apply what works for you. It's about developing your own toolkit, both in terms of technical skills and artistic sensibilities. And those two things work in tandem. As your technical skills grow, so does your ability to express your creative ideas more effectively. And as you experiment and explore creatively, you'll inevitably encounter new technical challenges that push you to further develop your skills. So it's a continuous cycle of growth and development fueled by both technical knowledge and creative exploration. Now thinking about our listener, what are some of the biggest takeaways they can apply to their own mixing journey? Well, one of the most crucial things I think is that emphasis on the arrangement stage. A great mix starts with a solid foundation. So focusing on creating a well-structured arrangement with clear sonic separation, will save you a lot of headaches later on. It's like preventative mixing. Right. Laying the groundwork for a smooth and enjoyable mixing process. Exactly. And then, of course, there's that practical tip about phase relationships. Yeah. Especially in the low end. Yeah, that's a big one. It's such a simple check. But aligning those waveforms can have a huge impact on the clarity and punch of your mixes. Absolutely. And for those prone to dob you rabbit holes, remember the five-click rule. Streamlining your workflow can free up so much time and energy to focus on what really matters, the music. And lastly, that discussion about online advice and the loudness wars really highlights the importance of critical thinking in music production. Yeah, you gotta be careful out there. Don't be afraid to question what you hear. Experiment. And most importantly, trust your own ears. Develop your own unique voice, your own critical judgment, and don't be afraid to experiment. That's how you grow as a mixer and create music that truly connects. Couldn't have said it better myself. Well, on that note, I think we're gonna wrap up part one of this deep dive. We'll be back soon with part two, where we'll continue to explore the insights and wisdom of In The Mix. Looking forward to it. See you then. Welcome back to part two of our deep dive into In The Mix's 10 years of mixing advice. And you know, in the last part, we were talking a lot about kind of the more technical aspects of mixing like phase and EQ and compression. Right, the nuts and bolts. But this time I want to shift gears a little bit yeah. and talk about some of the more philosophical aspects of mixing. The bigger picture stuff. Exactly. So one of the things that he talked about was the importance of not getting too caught up in the technical details. Yeah, he said something like, sometimes you just gotta let go and trust your ears. Right. It's easy to get lost in the weeds especially when you have all these amazing tools at your disposal. Like all the plugins and processors and whatnot. But sometimes. Yeah. The best thing you can do is just step back. And listen to the music as a whole. He even said that sometimes. I'll mix a track and then he'll walk away from it for a few days. And come back to it with fresh ears. And he'll realize that he overdid it. He got too caught up in the technicalities. And he lost sight of the emotion of the music. So it's all about finding that balance. Yeah. Between the technical and the emotional. And trusting your gut. Now, another thing that he talked about was the importance of having a clear vision for your mix. Right. Knowing what you're trying to achieve. Before you even start mixing. It's like having a blueprint for your house. You wouldn't start building without one. Exactly. And he said that the best way to develop a clear vision 
is to listen to a lot of music. And not just music in your genre. Listen to all kinds of music. And pay attention to the things that you like. And the things that you don't like. And try to figure out why. What is it about those mixes that you find appealing? Or unappealing. And then try to apply those same principles to your own mixes. He also had some interesting thoughts about the loudness wars, which we touched on briefly in the last part. Right. He said that loudness won. But he also acknowledged that. It's not just about making everything as loud as possible. There's more nuance to it than that. So let's say our listener has a track that's technically within those recommended loudness levels, but it just doesn't have that punch, that impact they're looking for. Yeah, what would you advise them to do? Well, first I'd encourage them to listen to reference tracks in a similar genre. Pay attention to how those tracks are balanced and how loud they feel. And then experiment. Don't be afraid to push the levels a bit. See what happens. He even mentioned that sometimes. Exceeding those recommended levels can actually translate to a better listening experience on streaming platforms, despite their loudness normalization algorithms. Really? Yeah, it's a bit counterintuitive, but it's something that many mastering engineers are taking into account these days. So it's a delicate dance yeah. between technical knowledge, artistic judgment, and a deep understanding of how music is consumed in today's world. It's fascinating, isn't it? The world of music production is constantly evolving, and it's exciting to see how these experienced professionals are adapting and pushing boundaries. It's a great reminder for all of us to stay curious, keep experimenting, <laughs> and never stop learning. So as we wrap up part two of this deep dive into a decade of mixing wisdom, mm. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the idea of letting go of the technical detail. And trusting your ears. Because I think that's something that a lot of us struggle with. Yeah, it's definitely a challenge, especially when you're first starting out. You're so focused on learning all the technical stuff that it's easy to forget about the most important thing, the yeah. music. You're so busy tweaking knobs and pushing buttons yeah. that you forget to actually listen to what you're doing. And that's when you start to get lost. So how do you find that balance? Between the technical and the emotional. Well, it's all about setting intentions. Before I even start mixing. I ask myself, mm -hmm. what is the emotion that I want to convey with this track? What is the story that I want to tell? And then I use the technical tools at my disposal. To support that vision. I don't let the tools dictate the direction of the mix. I use them as a means to an end. And I always try to keep the bigger picture in mind. The emotion of the music. The story that I'm trying to tell. And if I ever find myself getting too lost in the details. I take a step back and I ask myself, is this serving the song? Is this helping me to convey the emotion that I want to communicate? And if the answer is no, then I let it go. So it's all about finding that balance between the head and the heart. The technical and the emotional. And trusting your gut. Now, I know we've covered a lot of ground in this part, but I want to leave our listener with one final thought. And that is, don't be afraid to experiment. Try new things. Break the rules. Because that's how you discover your own unique voice. And that's what makes your music special. So go out there and make some magic. We'll be back soon with part three of this deep dive, where we'll continue to explore the insights and wisdom of In The Mix. See you then. Welcome back to the final part of our deep dive into In The Mix's 10 years of mixing advice. It's been a great conversation so far. Yeah, we've covered a lot of ground. From the technical aspects of mixing like phase and EQ, mm -hmm. to the more philosophical stuff like trusting your ears and finding your unique voice. And you know, one thing that's really stood out to me is how much emphasis he puts on the creative side of mixing. Yeah, he really wants people to see mixing as an art form, not oh. just a technical process. Right, it's not about following a set of rules. It's about using your ears and your intuition. To create something that sounds good, to evoke an emotion. And I think that's something that's often overlooked in the world of music production. People get so caught up in the technical details that they forget about the bigger picture. The music itself. And you know, one of the things that he said that really resonated with me was that a good mix starts with a good arrangement. Yeah, that's so important. If your arrangement is solid, the mix will practically take care of itself. It's like having a strong foundation for your house. If the foundation is weak, the whole house is going to fall apart. But if the foundation is strong, you can build anything you want on top of it. And the same goes for mixing. 
If your arrangement is well structured, mm -hmm. with clear separation between the instruments, the mix will just flow naturally. You won't have to fight against it. You'll be able to focus on the creative aspects of mixing, like adding depth and dimension mm -hmm. and creating a sense of space. So yeah, I think that's a really important takeaway from this video. Start with a strong arrangement. And the rest will follow. Now, another thing that he talked about was the importance of referencing. Right. Listening to other tracks in your genre. To get a sense of how they're mixed. And how they sound. And he said that it's important to listen to a variety of tracks. Not just the ones that you like. Because you can learn something from every mix. Even the ones that you don't like. You can figure out what you don't like about them. And avoid making those same mistakes in your own mixes. And you can also get ideas from the mixes that you do like. And try to incorporate those elements into your own work. So yeah, referencing is a really valuable tool for any mixer. It helps you to develop your ears. And to expand your sonic palette. And to get a better understanding of what works. And what doesn't work in the world of mixing. Now, before we wrap up this deep dive, I want to touch on one more thing that he mentioned in the video. And that is the importance of having fun. It's easy to get so caught up in the technical side of things that we forget why we started making music in the first place. Because it's fun. It's a way to express ourselves, to connect with others. To create something beautiful. So if you're not having fun, if you're feeling stressed out or overwhelmed, take a step back and remind yourself why you're doing this. Because you love music. Because it brings you joy. And don't be afraid to experiment. Try new things. Break the rules. And most importantly, have fun. Because that's what it's all about. Well, that's it for our deep dive into In The Mix's 10 years of mixing advice. We've covered a lot of ground from the technical to the philosophical. And I hope you found it as insightful and inspiring as we have. So go out there, make some music. And have fun. Thanks for joining us. See you next time.